Hi, my name is Surabhi Ramsundar. I'm a, a consultant in emergency medicine, presently at Bexham Park Hospital. Um, and today we're going to talk about disordered consciousness. Um, the session for today is going to be a case-based discussion. Uh, the aim is to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, understandably, this is via a virtual media. So um, it would be great if you could unmute yourself and um, ask any questions and um, um, answer uh, the questions that I put forward as well. So we're going to start with our case. Um, we're going to get a patient in our emergency department today and uh, we will assess her. We'll see how she's doing. Um, and as the case progresses with her through her journey, we'll try and learn a few things. So um, there's a 53 year old female who comes into your emergency department and she's presented with a very severe headache. You go in to assess her in the cubicle. Uh, you find that she's sitting there on the hospital trolley holding her head in her hands, okay? So what questions do you want to ask her in order to get a better understanding? Someone says you need to take a history. Yeah. And what would you like to ask her in her history? Ask about the onset of the, his of the headache. Yes, fantastic. Anything else? Uh, the course and the duration, the nature, yes. the character. Someone says Socrates. 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 Fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. So we want to ask her questions about her headache because that's what she's coming with. And the mnemonic is perfect. Socrates, we want to know what's the site of headache, what's the onset character, radiation, what are the associated factors? What's the timing, duration, exacerbating, relieving factors, and the severity? So she answers all these questions of yours. So she says that the headaches at the back of her head, it was sudden in onset, it came up in seconds. Uh, the character is as if someone's hit her on the back of her head. Um, it does radiate down her neck. This is associated with nausea. She's vomited twice. Um, and she also mentioned that the light was bothering her. When did it start? It started about two hours ago and it's still present. Exacerbating factors, what was she doing when it started? Well, she was mowing the lawn when it started and it's very severe. In fact, it's the worst headache of her life. And uh, on a scale of 10, she says it's 10 on 10. She also mentions that about two days ago, she had a similar headache. It was again at the back of her head, but it was short lasting. And this was when she was cleaning the house, right? So these are questions about headache. You also want to know something about her, her background. What's her past history, medical history, allergies, drugs, social, and all those kind of things. So when you ask her these questions, she says um, she's got high blood pressure. She does suffer from migraine. She takes amlodipine for her blood pressure. She takes painkillers whenever she gets a headache. She's not allergic to any medicines. She normally lives at home. She's independent. She does smoke about 10 to 15 a day and consumes alcohol occasionally. Family history-wise, she's a fam there's history of high blood pressure and her maternal uncle died after a headache. Okay. So what do you think is wrong with her? Any guesses? Someone's already said a subarachnoid. Brilliant. A brilliant, brilliant team is what we have. So that's very right. She does have a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And why do we say that? because she takes all the boxes. She's right out of the book. Uh, she's got a thunderclap headache. It was sudden and onset. It reached a peak within seconds and reaches a maximum within five minutes. It starts from the occiput and it's very typical of the patient to say as if they've been hit on the back of their head. It is very severe. It's the worst headache of their life. It can be associated with nausea, vomiting, neck stiffness, syncope, seizure. That headache that she had two days ago, the warning headache, would be from a sentinel bleed. A sentinel bleed is a little tiny bleed that started about a couple of days ago, but then it stopped and was almost like a warning before uh, the full-blown hemorrhage. If you do a fundoscopy, you'll see she's got a subhyloid hemorrhage, and sometimes they can also come in with a focal neurological deficit, that is with a third nerve palsy. We'll get into the details of all this later, but let us now understand how to approach headaches. Headaches are, of, uh, are basically classified into two types. Any guesses? Acute chronic. Okay, okay, that's one way of classifying. 
how I've classified A's as primary and secondary, okay? Primary headaches are four. We have, any guesses again? So primary Thinking headaches headache, are- Cluster headache, migraine, yes. Brilliant, brilliant, yes, that's right. So we have migraine, tension, cluster, and even coital cephalgia, okay? Let's talk about each one of these. So migraine, the term that we, it can be used as a mnemonic and it's also described as a pounding headache. Okay, so pound can be used as a mnemonic piece for pounding. Onset, although the patient says it did come over quickly, it's never as quickly as a subarachnoid hemorrhage. It usually builds up over a period of four hours, four to 72 hours, in fact. It is unilateral. It's associated with nausea, vomiting, patients complaining of photophobia. It can be quite disabling could be associated with an aura. There's a family history usually and most commonly affects females. Next is tension headache. Any idea what tension headache is? We do get these before exams, don't we? Well, I used to. How does tension headache feel like? So tension headaches are not pounding, they are band-like, okay? It feels like there's a tight constricting band around the head. Onset is gradual, it is bilateral, so it's a band all the way on both sides of the head. They may not have nausea and vomiting, instead they have pericranial tenderness. It's almost like if you hold your head where the head hurts, if you can feel the skin is tender. This can be disabling too. It's moderate in intensity. And in fact, it's one of the most common types of headaches. Cluster headaches. What are cluster headaches? So as the name says, they come in clusters. They last for about 30 to 120 minutes and they can last over several weeks. And then they can vanish and they're completely absent for a few months. They are usually unilateral and they start affecting the eye. So there's there is the conjunctiva is red, the eye is watering, and it follows the trigeminal distribution. Okay, so I've got some images here. So migraine, like I said, is unilateral. Tension headache is band-like around the forehead and go goes all over the back. Uh, and cluster headache, the pain's usually concentrated around the eye and there's, there is the eye is watering, it's red, and that's more commonly in men. Coital cephalgia, as the name says, is a sudden onset explosive headache, which can come or is related to a sexual activity. This is quite severe, it's throbbing, and it can actually be quite similar to a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So in fact, when the patient comes to you after the first episode of coital cephalgia, it's important to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, so these are primary headaches. Secondary headaches are those which are secondary to something, secondary to a cause. So the cause can be anything. It can be after a head injury. Post-concussion headache is a secondary headache. There can be vascular causes. One of these we've already discussed, that is the subarachnoid hemorrhage or any other kind of bleed inside the head. Even an aneurysm or an arteriovenous malformation can give this kind of a headache. CST or cavernous sinus thrombosis and temporal arthritis can also result in that. Infections such as meningitis, encephalitis, or meningoencephalitis, or any kind of intracranial abscess. Other causes of secondary headaches are metabolic, low levels of oxygen, or high level of CO2, or even low blood sugar levels. Ixol, that is intracranial space occupying lesion in the form of a tumor, or a mass, or a metastasis. metastasis. Eye problems, even refractive errors when the, when the eye glass power changes, that can also produce a headache. Glaucoma is another differential. Certain drugs, coffee, lack of it or excess of it can produce a headache. Alcohol, carbon monoxide poisoning, and even nitrates. Have you heard where patients commonly, you know, those who have uh, cardiac problems or chronic uh, ischemic heart diseases, when they come to you and they say, oh, I had a chest pain, then I took two puffs of my GTN and it gave me a headache because it causes cerebral vasodilation and that produces the headache. So it's very common to get a headache after nitrates. Idiopathic um, intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri and headache after an LP procedure. They're all secondary headaches. So 
We've understood primary headaches. We've discussed one of the secondary headaches, that is subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm just going to touch on a few of these other secondary headaches. So meninges, I'm sure you all know this. Um, this is just for a quick revision. Meninges has three layers, the outer layer is the dura mater, the innermost is the pi mater, and in between we have the arachnoid. Okay, inflammation of meninges is called Meningitis. Fantastic. Can anybody tell me what are the signs and symptoms in meningitis? So the patient will come to you with headache, obviously, because that's the topic we're talking about. Other than that, what else will they Fever. have? Fantastic. Fever, vomiting. Yeah. Photophobia. And they have uh, neck pain when they uh, uh, kneel in uh, front or. Excellent. Yeah. And somebody also mentioned photophobia. I heard photophobia. Yeah. Brilliant. So that's right. So there is headache, there is fever, there's photophobia and neck rigidity that we've talked about. If it's a bacterial meningitis or a meningococcal meningitis, they'll have a typical rash. Okay. They could have come in with AMS. AMS is altered mental status. Uh, that is their consciousness might get affected over time. And they can even come in with focal neurological deficit. Now I'll be using these terms quite frequently. AMS is altered mental status or decreased level of consciousness. And I'm sure you've heard of focal neurological deficit. What it basically means is there is a neurological deficit, which is focal, meaning either they are not able to move a particular arm or leg or a facial muscle, or there are some eye signs. Okay, so it's a very focused sign. Right. So when you talked of neck rigidity, what was it? It was a sign of meningism. Can you tell me any other signs of meningism that we look for? Prozinski and Kerning sign. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That's right. So there is neck rigidity, Kerning sign, and Brodinsky sign. How do you differentiate? And do you have any ways of remembering which one is which? I used to get confused between Kerning's and Brodinsky. Any idea? The first one, mm -hmm. I can detect it, passive movement of the neck. So okay. I can this rigidity of the neck. The okay. second one, uh, by uh, passive uh, extension of mm -hmm. the flex uh, knee, mm -hmm. I think. So you yeah. can add the pain to the patient. Excellent. And the patient can test your uh, movement. Yeah. Uh, Brodzinski, by yeah. passive flexion of the neck, uh, yeah. you can see passive uh, uh, flexion of the pose. That's absolutely marvelous. That's very right. So neck rigidity, as you correctly mentioned, is when I try and lift the neck of the patient, the, bed, the patient's lying supine on the bed. I just slide my hand underneath their head, ask them to completely relax, or unless they are completely knocked out, obviously. I would try and lift their head. And yes, there'll be rigidity. The neck would, would feel quite stiff, almost as a board. The way I remember Ker Koenigs and Rudinsky is K is for K. So Koenigs is for knee and B is for B. Brudinsky is for bending the neck. Okay, I don't know if it helps you, but it always helps me. So in Koenigs, Koenigs sign, as you correctly said, when the hip is flexed and I'm trying to passively extend the knee, the patient will complain of pain in the neck or you won't be able to extend the knee. And in Brudinsky, what is happening is when I try to flex the neck, there is passive flexion of the hip and the knee. <clears throat> and why is this happening? Because of meningeal irritation. The covering of the brain, which is the meninges, is inflamed, it is irritated. So the moment you try and stretch it, please do remember this meninges goes down, which is covering the brain, also covers the spinal cord. So it's going all the way down the back. So if you fiddle with it at any end, uh, the other end will be, um, will be painful, all right? Okay, so that's quick, that was quickly about meningitis. Ixol, Ixol stands for intracranial space occupying lesion. As you can see in the CT scan here. So there's, there's a big circular mass there. What else can it be? It can be a tumor, it can be an abscess, it can be some kind of an infection like in case of toxoplasma. It can be anything. It's a mass which is sitting in a particular area of the brain. So when a patient has this, how would they come in? What will be the signs and symptoms? Obviously headache, because that's our topic. Anything else? Focal neurological deficit. Excellent. And? 
And why do we say focal neurological deficit? Why in FND? Because it's sitting in a particular area of the brain. So it's going to press that area. Sorry? It may affect the relation and uh, I think the, uh, the co-function of the patient because it's near the, the front wall. Yeah, exactly. So the area where the mass is sitting, um, that's the area that will be affected. And depending on where it is, it can be the frontal, parietal, temporal lobe, wherever it is, it'll cause symptoms on the basis of, basis of that. Also remember, there's a little mass. It's almost like a golf ball sitting inside the head. So when they move their head, it'll be more painful. So the, the headache will get worse with change of posture when they bend down, when they're lying down, or when they cough, any kind of, uh, any activity which increases uh, pressure like a valsalva. So coughing, sneezing, all these things can aggravate the pain. Okay, so let's go through that. This headache will be gradual. Why? Because the mass, whatever it is, is not going to come up suddenly like a, like a bleed. Do you agree? So it's, it's going to come very gradually. So there'll be gradual headache. It'll be worse, as we said, with change in posture, on lying down or bending forward with Valsalva. There'll be focal neurological deficits. There can be seizures. If it's affecting the eye area, it can cause visual problems. If the pressure inside the head increases, there will be papillary edema and they could be having projectile vomiting. Okay, moving on to the next. What is this? Any guesses? It's obviously something to do with the eye. Acute closure glaucoma. Fantastic, excellent, that's right. So it's an acute angle closure glaucoma. What happens here? Okay, so um, as the name says, it's acute, happens suddenly, angle closure. So there is closure of the angle which results in glaucoma. So what's glaucoma? There is increase in intraocular pressure. The eye is a ball if, which is filled with fluid. If the pressure inside that water ball, it's almost like a water balloon. If the pressure inside that water balloon increases, there'll be pain in the eye, right? And obviously all the things that the eye does, it won't be able to do, you won't be able to see clearly. So there's the anterior chamber, which is in front of the colored part of the eye, that's the iris, and anything behind it is the posterior chamber. There is liquid which is generated in the front of the eye and then it's supposed to travel to the back. If that angle gets closed or tight, that fluid will not be able to move from the anterior to the posterior chamber, which increases the pressure inside the eye, that acute angle closure glaucoma. So what will happen here? Obviously the eye will be painful, the patient will be able to see clearly, and they'll obviously have a headache on the same side, yeah? And when you look at the eye, how does the eye look? How does the cornea, the white part of the eye look? Does it look white? No, red. It looks red. Loudy. Injected. Excellent. So there's conjunctival injection or it's red in color. The cornea would be cloudy, yeah? If you look at the anterior chamber through a slit lamp, it will be shallow. The pressure inside the eye would be high. There'll be raised intraocular mm. pressure. And, uh, yes. Sorry, continue. You were saying something? No, thanks. Okay. And the pupils mid dilated. It's not reacting really well because of all that pressure inside the eye. So these were a few of the secondary headaches. Another one is temporal arthritis. I should have, um, I should have kind of hidden that part, but it says it all. So temporal arthritis or joint cell arthritis um, is, as the name says, arthritis. There is inflammation of the temporal artery. And where is the temporal artery? Where is the temporal artery? In the temple area. The temple. In the yes, on either side. So it's very commonly seen in, in front elderly. of the temporal area. Yes, in, 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 the, in the temporal area, that's right. So in the mental area. So um, the, this is more commonly seen in elderly females about more than, more than 50 years of age. They come in with a unilateral headache over the temple area. This is also associated with scalp tenderness. There would be associated jaw pain. There'll be visual disturbance. 
there'll be decreased pulsations of the temporal artery. An important test we do is ESR, which will be elevated. There'll be more than 50. And you need to start steroids early. Why? To avoid the same thing before happening on the opposite or contralateral eye. Yes, and it also causes early visual impairment. So in order to prevent that, you want to start steroids early. So here's a little picture. It kind of summarizes what all happens here. Basically, what is happening is there is inflammation of the temporal artery. In fact, the external carotid artery and all its branches, most commonly the temporal one. And this results in narrowing of the lumen. There are giant cells. If you do a biopsy and a histopathological examination, you'll find that giant cells in the tunica media of the temporal artery because of which the lumen is narrowed, reducing the flow, producing the headache. Okay, right. So understandably, I'm not, I can't go into details of every type of headache, but I'm just trying to touch on as many types of um, secondary headaches as we can. So now coming on to red flag signs, you have a patient who's come in with a headache. You want to look out for red flag signs, signs which are the warning signs, uh, which make you suspicious that hmm, this is not a simple headache, there's something else brewing there. What all do you think are red flag signs in a headache? Sudden onset. Excellent. Sudden and onset. Yeah. Weight loss. You from sleep or in the morning? Visual. Early morning. Visual yes. Visual defect. Yes, that's right. Visual defect. Yes. So by now, I think you would have realized I'm quite a mnemonic person. So the mnemonic for this is Snoopy. Okay. So S is for systemic features. If they have any kind of fever rash could be meningitis if they have a coagulopathy a bleeding tendency they could have bled inside the head if they have any other systemic problems like cancers or hivs that means there could be a mass inside the head okay if the patient comes in with a headache and a neurological deficit or some neurological sign like a focal neurological deficit or alter mental status obviously that's a red flag sign if the location of the headache the on the location is in the occiput if the onset is sudden in a very old patient, or even in those about 50 years of age, you'd be like a new onset headache in somebody who's 55 years of age, never had a headache, that doesn't seem right. If it's progressive. Okay, so you have a patient, like even, even the lady that we have, she used to have migraines, but if the headache keeps on getting worse or it's persistent for a long period of time and does not settle, then that's not right. Again, in somebody who's had headaches in the past, but this headache, if that's different or it's worse, that means something's not right. In a pregnant patient, because it could be cavernous sinus thrombosis, if the headache gets worse with change in posture or with pressure, also headache in very young individuals who are less than, who are almost one to two years of age, kids who come in and say constantly they're having a headache, then obviously something's not right. So these are red flag signs which will warn you that something's not right going on right here and you want to get certain investigations like CT and stuff. So you remember a lady who was sitting there with a hand uh, holding her head because of a headache? What shall we do for her? You remember you went in, you asked her history, she was sitting there holding history. her head. History and physical exam. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You just have history, you want to examine her. You want to ask her, you want to check her orbs, her vitals. Would you like to get a CT scan done for her? Probably, because we were thinking she has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You want to give her some painkillers? Yeah. So these are the things that you want to do. Our examination is always A to E. We'll cover that shortly. You want to give her some analgesia. So you're like, okay, fine. Let me prescribe some analgesia for her. And while you're prescribing her medication, the nurse alerts you that the patient's dropped her consciousness. Exciting. But before we get there, what is consciousness? Can anybody tell me what is consciousness? Awareness. Okay, excellent. Awareness and awakening. Yeah. And what do you mean by awareness? She's aware to time, person, and place. Okay, yes. So if somebody is aware to time, person, place, will we say they are conscious? They are oriented, yes. 
but are they conscious? Responsive. <laughs> yes, okay. So right, so definitely awareness is a component. So consciousness has two parts to it, okay? Arousal and awareness, okay? What does arousal mean? Arousal mean being awake. awake. Exactly. So being wakeful, that means the bulb is on. You understand? The bulb is shining. There is light. The person's awake. And awareness means responsiveness. So they're not only just awake, but they're also able to respond to whatever happens outside. Okay? So for consciousness to happen, both these components have to be present. Where does arousal come from? It comes, now we're going more towards the anatomy. Arousal comes from the reticular activating system, which is a structure in the brainstem. It is the area where the bulb shines, okay? This is how I used to imagine it to be. And our response comes from the cerebral hemisphere, the part of the brain that thinks and acts, okay? So information has to travel from the reticular activating system, which wakes us up, and go through the cerebral hemisphere so that we can respond. And this makes somebody conscious. So if there's a problem with the reticular activating system or both the cerebral hemispheres, then the patient will be unconscious. Are you following me? I personally felt this is important to understand. So any problem with the reticular activating system or as I said, both the cerebral hemispheres. Please note, if one cerebral hemisphere is working, like for example, in a patient with a stroke, where one cerebral, one half of the brain is gone, but the other half is working, the patient can still be conscious. Obviously, for the side of the brain which has had the stroke, they won't be able to move the, the, the corresponding act, uh, side of the body, but um, they would still be conscious, okay? So any problem with the reticular activating system, like a basilar artery stroke, or a raised intracranial pressure, which causes herniation of the brainstem, will cause diminished consciousness. Or any problem that affects both the cerebral hemispheres, like trauma, low glucose, low oxygen, low blood supply, any toxins, infections, or metabolic causes will hit both the sides of the brain and cause a problem. I'm now just going to show you a little snippet of uh, my note. Okay, so this, this was the diagram that I studied. So the outer area, the outer circuit, the semicircular portion is the cerebral cortex. Uh, beneath it, uh, labeled as BS is the brain stem. So the signal starts off in the reticular activating system or the RAS, which is responsible for waking up. It passes through the hypothalamus and the frontal lobe where the, the motivation takes place. And then it goes through the rest of the cerebral cortex because of which we are able to respond. So any problem in this brainstem or both sides of the cerebral cortex will result in loss of consciousness. So when a patient comes to you who's unconscious, do you have any way of differentiating them to make your life easy? Because if a patient comes to you because of with, with, uh, who's unconscious or decreased consciousness, it can be so complex. I mean, it can be because of so many reasons. Is there a simple way of breaking it up to make your life easy? shine a light bulb through their eyes. Okay, so you're talking about examination, but that's fair enough, we do do that. Okay, so let me answer this. So when a person comes to you unconscious or with decreased level of consciousness, there are many ways to classify them in order to understand the cause of it. But one of the ways which I find really easy and useful in the emergency department is breaking, the, breaking them up into traumatic or non-traumatic. So the patient's lying there in front of me unconscious. Either it's because of a trauma or it's non-traumatic. Traumatic means either they've had some kind of a bleed inside their head or there's a concussion, either it's an EDH or an SDH or an SAH or an intraparenchymal bleed. Um, and a little clue there, blood on CT scan will appear white. So that's traumatic. The non-traumatic causes of unconsciousness can be divided into three, into three types. Those with signs of meningism, those with focal neurological deficits, 
and those without focal neurological deficits. Okay, with signs of meningism can be what? What are the what are the conditions that will come with signs of meningism? We we talked about it already. The meningitis. Meningitis, yes, and our lady subarachnoid hemorrhage. So these are usually the two conditions that come in with meningism. So if your patient's non-traumatic, like in our case, and she's having signs of meningism, she's either got meningitis or probably subarachnoid hemorrhage. Easy to categorize? Then if they don't have meningism, you look for signs of focal neurological deficit. If maybe they are not able to move just their right arm and their right leg, maybe there's something wrong with the left side of the brain. So you look for focal neurological deficits. So if they do have it, it can either be because of vascular causes, having a little bleed in a particular area. Maybe they have a bleed on the left side of the brain because of which they can't move the right side or there is a stroke, an ischemic stroke. If there is an abscess sitting there, sometimes meningoencephalitis can present with cranial nerve damage, which can mimic a focal neurological deficit. A tumor, a tumor sitting in one part of the brain, like we saw in the intracranial space occupying lesion, Ixol photograph of the CT scan, that can present with a focal neurological deficit. Also remember, low blood sugar levels can also present with focal neurological deficit. So it's a very misleading sign. So whenever you get a patient of who's unconscious or with decreased consciousness, one of the first and the easiest bedside investigations that you can do is check their blood sugar levels. Because if you correct it, the patient will be fine. And then we have those where there are no focal neurological deficits. The patient's floppy, the patient's unconscious in front of you. There are no signs of meningism. There's no specific, they are completely, it's not that they are not able to move only their right side or their left side. They aren't moving any side of the body, just, just flat in front of you. So the mnemonic for that is AEIOU tips. I, I used to find this extremely easy, especially for final year exams because it's, it's easy to recollect and reproduce. Um, A stands for alcohol, someone who's drunk, how will they be? Low conscious, flat, and without any focal neurological deficits. Acidosis, arrhythmia, if they are unconscious because of a cardiac arrhythmia, the heart is, the electric current in the heart is not, not flowing well. Environmental causes, if somebody is very hypothermic, it's winter, it's really cold, the body temperatures drop down to maybe 30 degrees Celsius. They will just be flat and unconscious without an FND. Electrolyte problems, endocrine issues, endocrine problems like, like low thyroid, yeah? Infections, general body sepsis, somebody who's coming in with urosepsis or sepsis from a lung infection, okay? Meningoencephalitis, overdose, of certain drugs like tricyclic antidepressants, low level of oxygen. If the patient does not get oxygen, they, they'll get unconscious over time. Uremia can result in uremic encephalopathy. Trauma and tumor, again, just for a mnemonic, but we've already covered that separately in traumatic and the ones with FND. Insulin, excess of insulin and deficiency of insulin, both can result in problems. Psychiatric causes, poisoning and strokes. Okay, so that was our classification. So when you get a patient with decreased level of consciousness, how do you approach them? So you have a patient who's lying in front of you who's unconscious or maybe low level of consciousness. What are the things you want to do? Any ideas? What would you like to do? You vital to signs. Yes, you want to check their vital signs? Yes. Starting. Starting by A, B, C, D, E. Brilliant. You want to examine them in A, B, C, D format. Excellent. What else do you want to do? Classify if the patient is traumatic or not, yeah. not traumatic. Yeah. Classify. Was this from trauma? Was it a non-traumatic scenario? So you will know about it if, you, if somebody tells you about the, the scene where the patient was found. Isn't it? If they tell you this patient was found uh, you know, underneath the bridge, maybe they jumped off a bridge. You know, if it was a traumatic scene or after a road traffic accident, the patient was unconscious, maybe it's because of trauma. So you want to know history, what really happened. Then what will you do? You've got your history. You are examining the patient. You are doing their orbs. What else will you do? Blood samples. Yes, you will get some investigations done. Fantastic. So there are lots of things you want to do. The patient's lying there. You want to get some history. 
you want to investigate, you want to examine, you want to treat. Will you do this in a sequence or will you do all of this together? Together. Exactly. Together with the team. Fantastic. So you cannot do this the way we normally handle anything else. You can't say, okay, I am going to listen to the story first, then I will examine you, then I will get investigations. And once I've understood everything, I will treat you because you don't have the time for it. Here, there's somebody who's lying in front of you, floppy and flat. So you need to gather all of this together. And as someone very rightly mentioned, as a team. So you may start examining, but you can say, okay, you can ask a colleague, would you please be able to go get some history, look into their notes. So it has to be a collective effort. So in terms of history, will the patient tell you anything? The patient he, uh, he will not, but uh, asking his rel uh, relatives or the, uh, uh, the one with him. Yeah, exactly. Very good. Because so he's cannot... unconscious. Correct. So patients aren't going to provide you much information. Either they are completely unconscious or they have decreased level of consciousness. They might be mumbling a few words. They won't be able to give you a clear story. So you can ask relatives, you can ask bystanders, you can ask witnesses, you can ask the people who got them. You can ask the ambulance crew. Okay. You can ask family, next of kin, carers, eyewitness, police, if they are there, paramedics. You can look into hospital records. Sometimes the patient would wear a medic alert bracelet. It might say, I am diabetic. So maybe that means probably their glucose level has gone down. Okay, so check for all these things. It might even say they are epileptic, right? Fine. So you're going to ask all these people, but what are you going to ask them? What are the important things that you want to know? Imagine you entered into Risa. You've just got a patient who's lying there floppy. You decide, okay, fine. I have no information. Let me ask all these people. Let me get more information. What exact information do you want? I'll ask him what happened and the exact event that led to the unconsciousness. That's right. So th these are not trick questions, okay? I'm asking absolutely basic questions. Yes, yeah, so you want to know what really happened? Where did you find this patient? When was the patient last seen normal? Does the patient have, if it's a relative, you can ask them all those background questions. Medical history. Exactly, medical history, medication, drugs, allergies. Does the patient do any recreational drugs? When did you last see this patient? How did this happen? Was he complaining of anything? So all those things, past history, medical, allergy, social. Does the patient drink? If it's an alcoholic, maybe they're just drunk. If they take some kind of recreational drugs, maybe they've, they've overdosed on something. You want to know about the scenario. Was it on the road? Was it a road traffic accident? Had they jumped off a building? Okay, what is their baseline? What is the patient normally like? Maybe it's a patient with dementia. Maybe their level of consciousness is generally low. So you want to know, is this their baseline? Is this how the patient is normally? When did you last see them? Has the patient has had free previous such episodes? So for example, um, let's say in case of um, vasovagal syncope, somebody who, who's extremely, who gets very frequent vasovagal episodes if they stand for too long. Um, they keep they keep having these um, episodes where they have syncope, they, they have these syncopal events whenever they stand for too long. So you want to know have they had previous such events or in case of diabetics, maybe they don't take their medication properly or they accidentally end up overdosing their insulin. They could be going into recurrent episodes of hypoglycemia. So you want to know any previous such episodes and you also want to know what was the speed of onset? Did the patient become unconscious immediately? Or has, they, has their consciousness been going down gradually over a period of time? Okay, because all these questions will give you a lot of clues. If it was sudden in onset, well, he was absolutely fine two hours ago. All of a sudden he said he had a headache and now he's unconscious. Something's, what, what could be wrong? It could be a vascular event. Scenarios can give you clues about trauma. If the patient is on an oral anticoagulant from the history, oh, maybe this patient could have had a bleed inside his head, yeah? If it's a gradual decline over days, it's usually a metabolic cause, like maybe sepsis. Maybe the patient has a urinary tract infection, which has progressively got worse and their consciousness is going down. If it was sudden in onset in a very young patient, you have to think of trauma. You have to think of drug overdoses, alcohol, and even aneurysmal bleeds. In old geriatric patients, there could even be a slow bleed inside the head. If they're complaining of uh, they had some headache, then they were complaining of tingling for some, some time, tingling in one or both arms, and now they've suddenly got unconscious. 
probably means something's wrong with the head. Yeah? yeah. History will give you a lot of clues. Are you all following so far? Is the speed okay? Yes, perfect. Fantastic, lovely. So the next step is examination, treatment, and investigations. And like I said early, uh, earlier, we are not going to do this sequentially. We're going to try and do all of this together. So we start with C-spine, because if it's a trauma, one of the first things you want to do is secure the C-spine, okay? So you look for signs of trauma. If the history gave you clues about trauma, or if the patient's got bruising and all those kind of things on them, there probably has been some kind of a trauma. So you want, what do you do for treatment? You want to block and tape uh, the neck and take them on a trauma mattress. And at some point of time, you want to get a CT scan of their C-spine, right? And um, as one of you very correctly mentioned, our sequence of examination is going to be A, B, C, D, E. A is for airway. What do you want to see in the airway? So this is an unconscious patient. What do you want to do? You want to examine the airway? How do you examine the airway? Opening their mouth and see if there are any obstruction there. Excellent. So one of the easiest way of examining the airway is seeing if the patient's talking to you. If the patient is talking, sometimes, okay, their consciousness is low, but they're still mumbling something. They're saying something. They might be saying weird stuff, uh, unrelated words. So that's one way of examining. So you open the mouth. You see if the mouth is opening. If there's in anything inside the mouth, inside the oral cavity, you can also see, are they smelling of anything? Do they smell of alcohol? Sometimes they strongly smell of alcohol. And that's it. That's the clue. Maybe they were just drunk. What, how will you treat? Suppose this airway is not nice. You know, you open the mouth and you see there's a lot of uh, vomitus inside the mouth. mouth. What will you do? How will you treat it? You suction it, okay? They've got a lot of vomitus in their mouth. They've got some blood in their mouth. You immediately clear it. So the aim here is for you to understand that I'm going to examine. If I find a problem, I'm going to treat it right then and there. It's not that I complete an A to E examination. I examine, I see what's wrong, and I treat it there. So you look at the airway, you open the airway, you see, is it patent? What are you looking into the oral cavity? You are looking for any blood, any secretions, any vomitus. Does the patient smell of alcohol? If there's something wrong with the airway, it's a priority. You want to secure it early. In an unconscious patient, the first thing you want to check is, is their airway compromised? If it is, you want to secure it so that at least their airway remains patent. It's easy for them to compromise the, the soft tissues of the neck um, and, and can, can basically, that, that's, that's one of the reasons. Um, their consciousness level is low, they can start vomiting. So all these things can result in a compromised airway. So you want to secure it. You want to suction it. You want to clean it up. You want to ideally call a senior who can help you with all these things, okay? Next is breathing. What do you want to check in breathing? What is their respiratory rate? What is their saturation? What is their breathing pattern? If the saturation, oxygen saturation is low, you want to correct it. How do you correct it? You give them oxygen. You put them on an oxygen mask. There are other machines called NIV that, that give high flow oxygen. Any investigations you'd want to do for breathing? You want to get a chest x-ray to look at the lungs. You can do a blood gas analysis, okay? So are you understanding the pattern? You look at the airway, if there's a problem, you treat it. You look at breathing, okay, what's the respiratory rate? What's the saturation? What's the breathing pattern? What does the chest look like, feel like in terms of inspection, palpation, percussion, percussion auscultation? If there's any problem there, you treat it and you get certain investigations done for breathing. Let's come on to circulation. Any guesses? What do we do in circulation? How do you examine circulation? Blood pressure. Pulse rate, blood pressure. Blood pressure, pulse rate. Yes, capillary refill time. You look at the color of the patient. Is the patient pink, well perfused, or are they pale, um, cyanosed? Coolness at the extremity, if it's cool or not. Exactly. Are they well perfused? Is the blood flowing nicely to the peripheries? Otherwise, it'll be cool and clammy. Brilliant. So that's your examination. How can you treat? What can you do about it? Suppose their blood pressure is low. What will you do? IV fluids. Yes, IV fluids. So how will you give IV fluids? Through an IV cannula. So you want to take an IV cannula, at least two IV cannulas, okay? You want to give fluids. What investigations can you do there? 
تي بي سي اكسلنت اند اي بي جي يا ان اول ذا روتين انفستيجيشنز اوف بلادز liver function test uh, liver function correct correct excellent renal function test if the kidney is not right if their creatinine is very high uh, if they are in a new onset aki that can also result in decreased consciousness you want to get their coagulation level if there's a trauma you want to get group and save so that they can get blood transfusion later okay if you think the patient's overdosed on something you want to get the toxicology levels you can send levels for paracetamol salicylates okay you are uh, uh, you can also look for occult source of bleeding in the tummy uh, or in the retroperitoneum by getting a ct scan done so that was circulation next we move on to disability so how would you assess disability if there is any broken limb uh, okay that will be in exposure so let me give you a clue so disability means consciousness how do you assess that component of it neural uh, neural blood sugar blood sugar muscular and blood sugar muscular fantastic fantastic lots of correct answers so you want to look at gcs okay if you find gcs too confusing at least you can do an abpu score okay which is alert verbal, verbal pain, pain absolutely unconscious excellent that's right you want to look at the eyes someone talked about shining light in the eyes because you want to look at pupils and the eye movement you want to do a proper neurological examination okay if the patient's cooperating with you you want to see how is the motor response how is the sensory response you want to knock with a tendon hammer and check their deep tendon reflexes and you want to check their blood sugar level right um it's important to assess all these components before you give a paralytic agent for example if you think the airway is compromised okay and you want to secure the airway and for that you need to give certain medicines to completely relax and paralyze the patient it's important to do a quick um gcs a neurological assessment of the patient before intubating okay a couple of things i would like to talk about here if the blood sugar is low what can you do dextrose the sugar is low you give sugar um one thing to think about is considering timing okay if it's an alcoholic patient or a malnourished patient it's a good idea to consider timing before giving dextrose because you want to prevent vernix encephalopathy um if you think the patient is unconscious because of a drug overdose okay like heroin or opioid overdose you can consider giving naloxone okay what investigations can you do for the consciousness part i want to read it in it here you can do a ct head okay so i'm not saying we'll go in and out of ct scan but these are the things that you would want and you can club all your ct scans together okay fine so you come all the way to d okay we've sent blood investigations we've got some orbs we've got the chest x ray most of this can be portable Okay let's now go for a CT scan CT head we can also scan the neck if there's trauma coming on to exposure so you completely expose the patient and you're looking for temperature if the temperature is very low you warm them if the temperature is very high you cool them okay you also want to expose them because this will provide you with a lot of information if there's a head injury if there's a scalp laceration or hematoma it probably means they they were in a traumatic scenario you want to look at their tongue if you can because sometimes there can be blood of the tongue which which would suggest a tongue bite from a seizure look for incontinence uh if there is if their temperature is high and if they have a rash it probably means they are septic they could even have meningitis um what are the clues which will provide us uh for toxic uh any kind of toxins so their skin is cherry red in color uh it indicates carbon monoxide poisoning if there are needle stick marks if the skin's very dry it could suggest tca poisoning if they're profusely sweating it can be because of organophosphorus poisoning or hypoglycemia um if you see if you know from history that this is a drug user uh, the patient got needle stick marks all over they've got pinpoint pupils their respiratory rate is low and the gcs is also low that probably means they they overdose on nalox uh, on opioid so you want to treat them by giving naloxone So as you can see on exposure if i am checking the temperature if anything's wrong i'm treating it it's hypo or hyper treated 
you look for injuries. If there is, then accordingly treat it. If you think it's a seizure, you may want to consider anti-epileptic. If it's a sepsis, sepsis or any kind of meningitis, then you want to shoot them with antibiotics. If there are toxic problems, then you want to appropriately try and give the antidote if available. So my basic point here was to make you understand that history taking, investigation, um, examination, treatment, all these things go together in an unconscious patient who's not going to provide you much information. Okay. GCS. Um, how comfortable are you with GCS? Do you want me to explain how it is uh, and go through all these components quickly? Or I'm happy to skip it if you are, if you're well versed. Yeah, I know the glasgow scale. You know glasgow scale. Fantastic. So the maximum they can score is? 15. And the minimum is? 3. Excellent. Brilliant. So it's never Three. zero. Okay, one quick question. Do you know how to differentiate between decorticate and decerebrate? Uh, decorticate is a flexion of the upper limb and extension of the, of the legs. Uh, oh. Decerebrate is extension of the uh, legs and the, of the upper limb and the lower limb. Excellent, brilliant. How do you remember that? Because you're clever. I just know it, I don't know. <laughs> because you're very clever. But um, a, another mnemonic to remember is if you see decerebrate, it has so many E's in it. Yeah, it, it basically means extension to pain. Okay, and decorticate is flexion to pain. It's almost like the arms are coiled in front of the chest. Which out of these is worse, corticate or cerebrate? decerebrate okay and that's why it, it gets a lower score so extension of the upper limb um, is actually along with obviously the lower limb is worse as compared to flexion okay so we won't spend too much time on gcs let's quickly go through coma cocktail have you heard of it no so so it's not very commonly used in a lot of countries uh, but um, in, in certain places, it can be quite useful, okay? Uh, it, it is quite commonly used sometimes um, um, in the pre-hospital setting, okay? When it's very difficult to reach um, either a, a care center or any, kind of a, or any kind of a medical center. So uh, it's not almost always given, but can be quite useful. So it's, as the name says, it's a cocktail, which is given for somebody who's in coma. Uh, they don't do it very frequently these days because we are now quite advanced. We can check before giving them medication, but if they don't have anything, they feel at least it's better to administer something rather than nothing. It includes a few things. It includes thiamine, naloxone, and glucose. So what they used to do was if the patient's GCS is low, they'll just give them glucose. Well, because probably they're hypoglycemic. If it's, if it's, fine, it's 17 hours, I'm sorry. It's, it's my laptop. Um, if the sugars are low, um, the, the glucose that you've administered would correct it. Um, it would also contain thiamine in order to prevent vernix encephalopathy, especially in alcoholic, malnourished people, those with hypoemesis gravidarum, anorexia nervosa, or those who are on dialysis because they tend to lose um, water-soluble vitamin, and thiamine is B1, which is a water-soluble vitamin. And it would also contain naloxone, which would revert um, or reverse anybody who's uh, unconscious because of an opioid cause. Okay. Uh, important to remember, naloxone is short acting, so you'll have to give repeated doses. Um, just a mnemonic to remember what's there in coma cocktail. If the patient's unconscious, they need to be given gin and tonic. Uh, G is for glucose, N is for naloxone, and T is for thymine. Right, coming back to our patient. Do you remember you were prescribing painkillers to our headache lady when she suddenly became unconscious and the nurse came to you and she told you about her not being right and then we started talking about how to approach a patient with low consciousness. So coming back to her, what's the first thing you want to do? You were standing there as a medical student in front of a patient who had a headache and now she suddenly become unconscious. What do you want to do? A, B, C, D, E. Okay, very good. Before that, would you like to call for help? Would you like to call a senior? Yes, yes, we yeah. call for help. Yes, so please don't hesitate. If you're standing in, somebody, in front of somebody and you're all by yourself, 
it's always a good idea to call for help call for more people you might need more hands you won't be able to do all of it all by yourself and as you correctly pointed out you want to do abcd so when you assess you find her airways patent her oral cavity is clear um respiratory rate is okay 18 she's saturating fine about 92% her chest is clear on auscultation so you give her some oxygen you put her on a non rebreather mask you connect her to 15 liters oxygen then you check her circulation her bp well it's slightly high it's about 150 90 pulse is 100 her capillary refill time is 3 seconds she's well perfused she's nice and warm so you have a nurse with you who quickly takes two cannulas she sends all those bloods and gases and you give her start giving her some fluids now you check her gcs her gcs is e2 v3 and m5 okay so it's 10 out of 15 she's definitely dropped her gcs she was sitting there talking to you telling you she's had, having a headache you check her pupils they're fine they're 3 mm they are reactive bilaterally you check her blood sugar level it is 7 it's normal so you don't have to worry about it Uh, her temperature is thirty-seven two, and she does not have a have a rash. Okay. So, while you just completed assessing her, the patient starts shaking all of her forelimbs. There's uprolling of her eyes. There's frothing at mouth, and now she's incontinent of urine. What is happening? Seizure. Brilliant. She's having a seizure now. Okay. So this patient is going to make sure that you learn all of neurology in just one patient. So she starts having a seizure. What do you do if somebody starts having a seizure in front of you? Protect her way, her tongue. Yes. Her in her side. Yeah. Fantastic. Avoid any harm thing. Brilliant. Avoid any harm thing. Avoid yes. her from falling from the bed. Correct. Correct. That's absolutely. We can correct. give her any medication. Yeah, we can give her medication. Uh, do you want to immediately give her medicine, or do you want to wait for some time? I think wait. Okay. Give her. Okay, you're stop. right. You're right. You're very right. Yes. So, as you said, the first thing you want to do is protect her, and because we in emergency just know A B C D E, we keep following the same thing again and again. You protect the patient. You make sure the patient's safe. You know, you don't want to want her to hurt herself because of the seizure. You turn her to a side. You put her in a little position. If she's uh, frothing and there's drooling saliva, you can suction it. You can support her airway by putting a nasopharyngeal airway. It's like a little trumpet, a little plastic tube in her nose to facilitate breathing. Um, you give her some oxygen. Okay. You can start fluids. You make sure her blood sugar is okay. Sometimes people can suddenly drop their blood sugar levels, and that can result in seizures. And you check her temperature. Okay. So this is zero minute. How long shall we wait? Before giving medicines, five minutes. 50. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I think I spoke too early. So the reason for this is most of the seizures will settle in one minute. They settle within a minute. Now, when a patient's having a seizure in front of you, has anybody seen somebody having a fit in front of them? Yes or no? no. Personally, no. Okay. Okay. Fine. Don't worry. When you when you have your rotations and secondments, you'll definitely definitely see a lot of seizures. So, when somebody is having a seizure, it can feel like a long, long time. It feels like it seems to be going on for a long period of time. But usually, they self self resolve or settle down within a minute. If a seizure is lasting for five minutes, that means something's not right. Okay. Something's really not right because of which it is lasting that long. It's what we call an impending state is epilepticus. Okay, impending means it's going to happen. So at five minutes, you can't wait anymore, and you're going to give medicines. And the best medicines that we can give are benzos. Okay, so you can give lorazepam four milligrams IV, or if they don't have an IV access, you can give diazepam, pyrrhectal, or a buccal midazolam. Okay. Our patient did have an IV access, so let us suppose you give her the IV dose. After giving the medicine, you're going to wait for ten minutes because you want the medicine to act. You don't want to keep shooting drugs into them, um, and that that can in turn, in turn result in complications and side effects. Okay, so you wait for ten minutes. It's now fifteen minutes. Okay, if the patient still continues to seize, you can give another dose of the same medicine, lorazepam. Or if you still don't have an IV access, 
you can give uh, per rectal diazepam or uh, buccal midaz. Okay, and then you wait again for ten minutes. By this time, you are getting impatient, and you should have a few seniors around you. Okay. If the seizure is continuing for 25 minutes, you want to start the patient on some kind of an infusion, either phenytoin. And if the patient's already on phenytoin, you can start them on phenobarbitone. You can even give them levotriacetam infusion, okay? And if they still don't have an IV access, you want to get an IO access. IO access basically means an intraosseous oh, yes. access. Fantastic, so you know about it. So it's, it's a little needle which is drilled into the bone, usually the tibia. Okay, and you can then inject medication into the bone marrow directly. And even after this, if the patient's continuing to have seizures, by 40 minutes, you want to intubate this patient with a medicine called thiopental, which is not only an anesthetic, but also an anti-epileptic and get this patient to ICU. So this is an extreme case scenario where your patient's not settling. And I'll be honest, normally we don't wait for 40 minutes. Okay, the patient would get tubed much earlier. Okay. So as you can see, this patient went into having seizures, but the seizure that kept going on and on and on is what we call status epilepticus. So any guesses about the definition of status epilepticus? Uh, it's a continuous epilepsy for um, 30 minutes or a recurrent epilepsy without regaining cons uh, consciousness for the same period. But uh, it is start uh, treating after, uh, as you said, uh, five minutes. Uh, yeah. Clinically, we treat it after five minutes because most of seizures that is, uh, continue uh, uh, five minutes, it will continue to 30 minutes and will become status epilepticus. Brilliant. That's what I know. Absolutely. No, I think you know it all. I think you know all of it. Uh, that's the exact definition. I don't even think I need to put the slide up now. So a single continuous seizure for 30 minutes or multiple short lasting seizures where the patient does not regain any consciousness in between is what we call a state of, state of epilepticus. And that's why, as I said, um, if, it's, if a seizure is lasting for more than five minutes, it's what we call an impending status epilepticus. The patient's probably going, into, going to go into a status. Obviously, it's not a good thing. You want to get a lot of investigations done. You want to scan their head. Uh, after ruling out a high intracranial pressure, you want to do an LP, which is a lumbar puncture. Even if the patient stops having seizures, you might want to do an EEG, which is an electroencephalography, which is looking at the electrical activity in the brain, because sometimes they can have what we call non-convulsive status epilepticus. That is, the electricity in their brain is shooting in all directions, but the patient's not really having a body fit. Okay, what we call non-convulsive status epilepticus. If it's a female, you have to check for pregnancy. You must do a urine dip. Um, or sent for a lab uh, beta HCG uh, because a female patient having seizures, what could it be? Preeclampsia, eclamptic fat. Eclampsia. Brilliant, super duper. So that's what we'll do. Shall we go back to our patient? So with the help of your senior, you managed to settle this patient's seizure. She's now intubated and ventilated and you request an urgent CT scan and you prepare to transfer this patient to the CT room, okay? So you take your oxygen cylinder, you have your transfer bag, which has all those fancy resuscitation medication and there's a suction device. You go into the CT and you get the scan done, okay? And uh, the radiographer who's sitting there now shows you the CT images. He's like, here you go. This is what is wrong with your patient. Look at the images. Before we look at the CT image, I'm going to give you some clues. Blood on CT looks white, new blood. Old blood will start looking gray and air will look black on a CT scan. Okay, ready to have a look at CT scans? Quick ones? Yes, yes. Yes. So what's wrong with this one? Subdural hemorrhage. Okay, why do you say it's a subdural? Actively bleeding white. Okay. And what is the shape? A lens shape. A ep lens shape, yes. Yes, I heard an epidural one. That's right. Yeah, so, epidural. Uh, that's right. It's an epidural hemorrhage. Again, the same. There's an epidural hemorrhage. And if you look at the red arrow, it's actually showing the skull fracture. Okay. So we're calling it an EDH or an epidural or an extra dural hemorrhage or bleeding outside the dura mater, okay? 
because it's biconvex or lens shaped. It does not cross the suture lines. It is a fast bleeding. Somebody said it's a quick arterial bleed. That's why it accumulates very quickly and makes a huge bulge. And a patient in this case could have a lucid interval. Anybody knows what's a lucid interval? Okay. The, no? Yeah. Go I on. think a uh, patient uh, f at first, uh, at uh, first at the trauma, uh, at time of trauma, he has mm -hmm. a disturbing consciousness level and then he starts to improve. This is the lucid yeah. interval. After yeah. that, he starts to deteriorate uh, again. Brilliant. Exactly. So very good, Isra. So what happens is the patient has a trauma, they lose consciousness, they come around, they regain consciousness, they are, they are conscious, they are orientated, they have capacity, um, and then they uh, decline again. So it's a very tricky phase because after a patient's been unconscious and they suddenly become normal and look normal, it's easy for people to think, oh, probably everything's fine, it was just a little trauma. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a very tricky phase and they decline quite rapidly after this. So this was EDH. Next scan, what is this? What is this is stopped you right here, Fantastic, good. Because it is concavo convex. It is underneath the dura, okay? And it is following the contour of the brain, okay? And it can extend all the way from the front to the back on one side, okay? So it is crossing the suture lines. And this is usually a slow bleed from a venous bleed from the bridging dural venous uh, veins. Uh, and it's most commonly seen in elderly who come to you with falls. So what happens is uh, in old people, the brain tends to shrink, creating a bit of space between the hard skull and the soft mushy brain. And whenever the brain moves because of a small fall or anything like that, that can result in an extensive amount of bleed. Okay, which is an SDH. Moving on to the next scan. I'm aware, I think we are, we've already run out of time. Are you all okay if we continue? I don't think I have many more topics left, but, um, but I, can, I can end it here if you want. No, continue, continue. Fabulous, thanks. So that was SDH, moving on quickly. Next scan is, next scan is here. What is this? Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Yeah, this was our lady. You remember? Um, uh, lady, lady was sitting there with her with a bad headache. So this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's bleeding all inside the arachnoid spaces. Okay, and this happens because of tearing of small leptomeningeal arteries or veins. Can be from an aneurysmal bleed. It can be spontaneous. It can be even traumatic. It can even be after a fungal infection. So another image to explain the bleeds, extradural, subdural, and the last, the third image here is actually an intraparenchymal bleed. Another image to kind of um, imprint this, we have the layers of the dura. Number one is epidural hematoma, which is outside the dura meter. Second is subdural. The third one is subarachnoid. And the fourth one is intracerebral hemorrhage. Okay, so now we are back in the ED. We know this patient has a bleed in her head. You call the neurosurgeons. But now you review the patient and you see all of this. So airway and breathing wise, she's intubated, she's ventilated. She's saturating 100%, so that's fine. Blood pressure is high now. She's, um, her blood pressure is 190 by 90. Her pulse is going low. She's come down to 60. When you assess her neurological status, um, her right arm has abnormal posturing, uh, pupils are unequal, her right eye is downward and outward. Any idea what is going wrong? Oculomotor nerve palsy. What palsy? What nerve palsy? Oculomotor nerve. Yes, exactly. And why do you think all of this is happening? Her blood pressure is going up, heart rate's going down, her posture has become abnormal, pupils are abnormal. CVA. Um, well, this is our lady who's already had a bleed in her head. So she, yes, she does have a cerebrovascular accident. Okay, our skull is a box of bone. There's not much space inside it, okay? There's the brain. Yeah, from the elevated the pressure. 
exactly so there is increase pressure in, on the brain stem yes so there is intracranial pressure so the brain is a tight box there is not much space you have the brain you have arteries you have uh, veins you have the cerebrospinal fluid so there's no space for extra stuff if there is extra bleeding the pressure inside that box is going to increase the only way it can get relieved is the venous return the, there is a little outflow of venous fluid and then the pressure goes on building up and starts pushing the brain stem down okay so this person person is potentially herniating okay so what are the features of an increase in intracranial pressure if it's a conscious patient they'll have headaches they will tell you they will exactly they can tell you about vision they'll say i'm not feeling right but um if the patient's uh intubated and ventilated where the patient can't tell you anything and you'll have to look for signs so you look for these signs if the patient's having seizures if there's change in vital signs cushing stride the blood pressure is going up the pulse is going down the breathing pattern is changing they start vomiting okay their posture changes there is abnormal posturing remember we read decorticate decerebrate so because she was extending she was decerebrating and you look at the eyes the pupils are different eye movements are different and if you look at the fundus there will be papilledema so going quickly what can you do to reduce the intracranial pressure give mannitol okay excellent what is mannitol i'm not going into pharmacology but just a quick line can can you tell me what what is what do you think could mannitol be an osmotic agent fantastic it's an osmotic diuretic okay so it kind of takes the pressure off takes the fluid off and makes the patient wee pass urine um and reduces the intracranial pressure so fantastic you can give mannitol what else can you do simple stuff so neuroprotective measures you can tilt the table okay you can bring the head end up so that gravity can do its job if the patient's intubated instead of tying the tube tightly around the face and increasing pressure just make sure you gently but securing uh, you know properly taping the tube for breathing you want to avoid hypoxia you want to maintain optimum oxygenation and you want to maintain proper normal co2 levels okay you can give mannitol you can give other kinds of osmotic diuretics uh, and you want to maintain a map you want to make sure that the blood flow to the brain is maintained in spite of the bleeding if the patient has a seizure they have a fit the brain's activity will go up and the pressure inside the brain will build up so you want to prevent them from having a seizure you want to give them seizure prophylaxis you want to make keep them nice sedated and completely relaxed so make sure the medications are going on well you want to control their blood sugars and you also want to control the temperature because if the temperature is low if they're feeling very cold they'll start shivering again that will increase the pressure and um, it's also important to catheterize this patient people who are intubated they can't tell you that they want to pass urine they want to go to the toilet so you have to make sure that they are well catheterized so that that in turn does not cause any problems okay so this was very superficially touching touching um raised icps and about the neuroprotective measures so you did all these nice things and now your patient safe neurosurgeons have come round and taken the patient over to the neurosurgical icu so you ended up saving our lovely lady so good job then Thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed the session today. Anybody has got any questions? Great lecture. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank Great. you very much. No problem. Thank you so much. I hope uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't cover everything, but because uh, the the topics were quite extensive, um, I tried to keep it as interesting as possible. And thanks for joining all the way from uh, Jerusalem.